how difficult communication is. One day I was driving. Uh, I wasn't driving. My brother David was driving. I was riding in the passenger seat with my brother David. And we were at Bob Jones University as students. And uh, we went down 291 toward Cherrydale. And he pulled in that uh, parking lot where it used to be a Bilo's. And uh, it's across from Shriners Hospital. Now it's not Shriners Hospital. You know the little shopping center I'm talking about. Yeah. So he was going through there, and uh, he was weaving between cars. You know, you're really supposed to go up and down the lanes. Is that right? But he's, he's yeah, he's doing like Fonda. He's going between the cars. So he went between the cars, and he said, Dan, do I have it? I said, yeah, you got it. And all of a sudden, crunch. He thought, I thought you said I had it. I said, you got it. I mean, I told you, you got it. He didn't like that a bit. So he had a great big long crease on the side of the car. You say, what's wrong with that communication? He said, do I have it? And I said, yeah, you got it. He did, right? <laughs> he got it. All right. So let's have a word of prayer. Only Michael appreciated that communication problem. <laughs> hey, is it difficult when you communicate with the people online? Yeah. And conference calls and all the rest of it. I have a very difficult time communicating with the people at the drive through window. Does anybody have a problem with that? I don't know if they can't hear me. I don't know if I'm speaking in some other language. I don't know what the problem is, but they always get it messed up every single time. I told Gail and Daniel, I said, you order from now on. And still it doesn't come out right. But most of the time it does when they order. But I can't get an order right for nothing. I don't know what it is about it. But anyway, I'm resigning from a few things, but I'm not resigning from preaching this message. So let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for these folks that are here. And I pray that you'll touch our hearts uh, with the message. And thank you for salvation. We're so thrilled to be saved this morning. So glad that we have eternal life. So glad that Jesus Christ has made all the provision of the world for our salvation. And we just thank you so much for Jesus Christ. May he be exalted today. May he be lifted up in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I'm going to review, first of all, without the slides, and then we'll review with the slides. But we've already covered two blockades of sin, uh, of salvation. And the first one was enslavement to sin. And let's see if I'm right. How many of you think I might be right or I might not be right? First one is enslavement to sin. How many of you think that's right? Okay, that's that. Okay, good. I thought I was on the right track. And the one that takes care of that, the process that takes care of that, is called something like what? Anybody got an idea? Reconciliation, and it's done through the process of redemption. There you go, Brother Dave. Thank you. So that's the enslavement sin is, is all enslaved to sin. But, and we're going to go through this again. But anyway, there's a separation between God and man. And the only way that that can be reconciled, and that's the thought is reconciliation, is through redemption. And he bought us out of the slave market of sin. We're going to cover it again with the slides, but I want to do it right now, kind of like a quiz. Now, the second one, if I'm not mistaken, was the sin nature. Is that right? Was the second block sin nature? I'm getting a little hum here, Charles. Uh, is, might be because I'm doing something. But anyway, how many of you remember the second sin nature? Anybody? I'm going to have to do something. All right. Yeah, I'm going to have to quit moving. That's what it is. I'm going to have to just be. Okay. Sin nature. And what took care of sin nature? Anybody got an idea? It's that idea of appeasing God or satisfying uh, something that is needed. Anybody remember the doctrine? It's expiation. How many of you can remember? Let's say that word together. Expiation. Expiation. All right, so let's get started here. So the third one is the removal of the block of physical birth. Do you know that your birth is a block to salvation? You say, sure, I know that preacher. So we have the sin nature's power that is indwelling in us. It's always there. We were born with a sin nature, but I'm getting ahead of myself. 
So let's get started here and let's see what we got. There we go. Ooh, back up. Okay. So there's the five blocks. Wow, what happened? There's a five block separating man from God and there's enslavement to sin, the penalty of sin, the spiritual death, and then the physical birth, sin nature. And uh, I kind of said that one uh, second block a little bit differently, but it's penalty of sin and spiritual death. And that is what happens to us. The physical birth, the sin nature we cover today, the character of God and his perfect righteousness and justice, and then our position in Adam. All of these keep us from being reconciled to God. Those are blocks between man and God. Now let's see what happens. As we just reviewed, reconciliation takes the place of uh, that, um, what was number one? Let's go back. Let's go back. Well, there it is. Enslavement to sin, right? And what's number two? Spiritual. Let's see, you got it. I'll go back. Penalty of sin, spiritual death. All right, so the, remember those two as we go through it. Reconciliation. Excuse me. I'm really getting excited. Expiation. Don't forget that one. And physical birth in nature we cover today. Well, watch out. Now we'll talk about redeem for just a minute. This is redemption all over again. Just a little bit of review. Redemption is to purchase in the slave market of sin, to lead out of the slave market of sin, to set free forever from the slave market of sin. I don't know about you, but I want you to know something. This is a powerful doctrine. Redemption, he not only sets us free from sin, he leads us out of sin. Praise the Lord, amen? Aren't you glad you've got that leadership of the Lord to lead you out of sin? Amen, that's wonderful. All right, so that's the doctrine of reconciliation and redemption is the process of that doctrine. Here's redemption's price. It's the cross of Calvary. I think we started off this morning with kneel at the cross, did we? Kneel at the cross, one of my favorites. The blood of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your father, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Don't tell me the blood of Christ doesn't mean anything. It's the precious blood. If the Bible calls it precious blood, do you think it means anything to God? You said that right. Some of these people say, and I'm talking about great preachers, say that the blood of Christ is synonymous with his death and his blood wasn't any different from your blood. Can I tell you something? That's heresy. That's flat out heresy. The blood of Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, is precious. And if the Bible said it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then I'll tell you it's precious to God, without price, very valuable. Amen. Amen. So we've got to remember the blood. All right. Then here's expiation reviewed again. To make amends, to show remorse, to remove guilt by suffering. You see the picture of Christ on the cross there, uh, carrying the cross, and he suffered for us. So we've got to remember, he made amends for the sin nature. And the price of the sin nature, the penalty of sin is death, spiritual death. So he suffered for that sake, for our sakes, to remove guilt by suffering punishment for wrongdoing. He suffered our punishment. You know, I've heard a lot of sermons on the cross of Christ, but I don't think we can touch the hem of the garment when it comes to the suffering of Christ. I wish to goodness somehow or another we could get it in our minds what he really suffered. And I cannot even imagine it myself. I can't describe it myself. But I want you to know he suffered for you and he suffered for me and everybody else. Now that's a lot of suffering. That's a lot of suffering. Death, the penalty for sin is removed. So expiation means the penalty of sin is removed, okay? Alone on the cross, whoa, back up. Alone on the cross, he was separated from God, my God. And the Holy Spirit, my God. 
He not only died physically for us, but he died spiritually as well. And there's a lot of people do not think about nor even conjure up the idea that he died spiritually. He died physically, that's sure. But he had to die spiritually or he could not have been a savior. So he died two deaths. He died physically and he died spiritually. There was no other way for us to have spiritual life. Expiation was completed by the words, it is finished. And those are powerful words. And I'm so glad it's finished. Amen? Amen. Amen. So here's those five blocks again. And the uh, power of sin, the uh, enslavement sin is removed by reconciliation through the process of redemption. Expiation makes amends to suffering for the wrong, takes care of the penalty of spiritual death by the cross of Christ to make amends. All right, so that's expiation. Now we've got a, the physical birth. And everybody sitting here had a physical birth. But can I tell you something? And everybody's standing here too. The physical birth is a block to salvation. It's a block that has to be overcome. So we're going to talk about that. Removal of the physical birth block. Man is born in sin with a sinful nature. I believe that, don't you? Do you know there's some people don't believe that? I don't know where they get their, I don't know what they're reading in their Bible, but something's wrong with their doctrine if they do not believe that man was born with a sin nature. We weren't born perfect and then, and then pick up sin. We were born in sin. We got a sin nature. You say, well, what about those children that die before the age of accountability, whatever that is? They go to heaven by the grace of God. That's another grace that we don't know much about. But those children that die before they reach an age to know what is right and wrong, God has a special grace for them. Praise the Lord. Amen. Aren't you glad for that? i tell you what, I know one preacher that said to people that lost a baby, and I know this personally, that that baby's in hell. Do you know how that made those people feel? You say, well, preacher, it's not their feelings. It's the truth that makes a difference. The truth is that babies go to heaven. What did David say? You know what David said when his child was died because of his sin with Bathsheba? You know what David said? He said, I can't bring them back, but I can go to them. And if David said, I can go to them, that baby was in heaven. Amen. We had a service over at uh, a funeral home over across town of a little baby that died. And I was called at the last minute to go and help with that funeral. It was some of the uh, people from Ponape. And uh, so I went over there at the last minute's notice and I'm driving over there with Daniel and I said, Lord, what am I going to preach on? I, I mean, last minute, folks, I didn't prepare anything. What am I going to do? And so I got over there and I found the passage about David and his child. And that little casket was there in front and all the uh, Pontipans and uh, so on were there. And I preached that message, a little bit of message on David and his child. And then I said, after the short message, I said, now how many of you want to join this little baby in heaven? Do you know if I remember right, it was nine or so people accepted Christ that day around that casket. We gathered around the casket and prayed the sinner's prayer with about nine people. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. But anyway, that baby was born with a sin nature. But he went to heaven because God has a grace for that baby before he reaches the age of accountability. I didn't mean to preach on that, but that's a good place to start. Amen. But after that baby reaches accountability, the sin nature is there for sure. And that baby will do wrong almost immediately. You ever seen a baby cry when they didn't need nothing? Didn't need one thing. Calling for mom and daddy and didn't need one thing. Maybe just a little bit of attention. You say, what were they doing? They were lying rascals before they even got started. <laughs> Amen. I probably was there too. Psalm 151, this is David talking, Psalm 51.5. Psalm 51 is David's prayer of repentance. Oh my, search me, know me. But anyway, great Psalm. He said, behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. 
Now you say, preacher, does that mean that David's mama was sinning when she uh, had sex with her husband? I don't think so. I don't think that's what it means. I believe it means that I have a sin nature. My mama is a sinner and I'm a sinner. Right? I don't believe it had anything to do with the sexual act at all. But some people teach that. By the way, if David's mama was immoral, I think the Bible would have made that clear. Don't you? Yeah, I think he would have. But by the way, children born in the immorality have a sin nature. Even though mama sinned, the child still is a sinner. I don't care what they are. You say, well, they're an illegitimate child. Well, can I tell you something? It doesn't matter if they're illegitimate or legitimate. They're born in sin. Every single one of them. Say, so it doesn't matter. I'm not going to treat an illegitimate child any less than I treat a legitimate child. Would you? They're the same. They're all born in sin. All right, well, let's go on. I'm getting too long-winded. This thing just doesn't want to cooperate with me. Now, you might see, I uh, put up here a picture of Nate Day. This is our, I guess, our first grandchild, I guess. Yes. He's 17 this month, Gail. He'll be 17 on September the 12th. So that tells you how long it's been since I made this. It's been 17 years since I made this video. PowerPoint. Psalm 127.3, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. I'm going to tell you something. Children are a blessing, not a blight. We're not to treat them as a curse. We're to treat them as a blessing. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you know what? I can't imagine the way people are doing it. They're leaving children on doorsteps now and on hospital steps and uh, everywhere, they, in trash cans, in bathrooms. I can't imagine that. Can you? Children are a reward. A womb, the fruit of the womb is his reward. By the way, every birth is a miracle. Is that right? Every birth is a miracle. I ain't never going to get through if I keep this up. A new baby is, is born alive physically, but dead spiritually. Ephesians 2, 1, And you hath he quickened, made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. This spiritually dead condition separates us from God. So here's the point. No matter what, how precious that baby is, no matter how great we think, think we are, we are born in sin and dead spiritually, and something has to be done about it. We are dead spiritually. Ephesians 2, 1, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. The soul is the real person. <clears throat> Lives in the physical body, is the ego, understands natural truth, but unable to grasp spiritual reality. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Do you know that the natural man cannot even think right about spiritual things? Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. It's a flat-out miracle that something has to take place inside the soul of man for him to even think about spiritual truth. To even think about something from the Word of God. Something has to happen. And we're going to find out if I get to it. And I think I will. What happens? This spiritually dead condition is caused by the sin nature received from parents. Romans 5, 12. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world. And death by sin and so death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. Since the biological parents cannot pass on to their children's spiritual life. By the way, there is a group that teaches that if you're part of the elect, then the children are automatically saved. That's false doctrine. That's not in the Bible. Amen. Just because you're saved doesn't make your children saved. Uh, so the biological parents cannot pass on to their children spiritual life. Then another father, I like this one, another father is necessary. Hallelujah. And another birth is necessary. Glory. I'm going to tell you what, this is good stuff. Another father is necessary. The father that we had is not going to help us get this reconciliation between God and man. 
My dad's a preacher and a holy man of God. My mom was a, a pastor's wife and a holy woman, but she couldn't do nothing about my salvation and she couldn't do nothing about my sin nature and dad couldn't do nothing about it either except preach the gospel. But still something had to happen that neither one of them could do. John 3, 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. A spiritual birth is necessary in order for there to be spiritual life. I think all of you know that, but it sure makes good sense to me. We got the wrong birth the first time. We sure need a good one the second time. Amen? Amen. Amen. First Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, that's mom and dad, or human nature, but of incorruptible by the word of God, and notice that word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Until a person has a new birth, there is no way to God. The doctrine of the new birth is called, and I like this one, regeneration. So the first block was removed by reconciliation and redemption. The second block, the penalty of sin and the sin nature, was removed by expiation, making amends and suffering for the wrong, removing the guilt and so on. But this block is going to be removed. This business of the spirit, the physical birth, this physical birth block is going to be removed by something, a doctrine called regeneration. So here we have these things again. There it is. There's a redemption, a regeneration. All right, let's move. Regeneration. Re means again. Generation means birth. Our beginning, or simply put as the King James Bible so specifically and simply says, born again. Can you understand that? Is anything wrong with born again? I don't need anybody to explain that to me. I need to be born again the second time, right? Amen. Amen. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration that's the individual soul, and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration. That's the rebirth of all creation. By the way, the creation needs the rebirth. How many of you know there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth? If there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, then that earth needs to be reborn and the heavens need to be reborn. Regeneration. When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. What about that? Another word in the Bible that means regeneration is born again. John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus responded as a natural man. He could not understand the spiritual truth. Natural man can't understand it. There are two kinds of people that respond in that way. Number one, the natural man responds that way. Number two, the carnal Christian responds that way. They think in physical action terms. There are two kinds of people who will have a hard time getting to heaven. The wealthy like Nicodemus and the religious like Nicodemus. <clears throat> Ezekiel 36, 24 through 26, for I'll take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring it, you into your own land. <coughs> then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your idols while I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. Wow, that's even in the Old Testament. Nicodemus, as a ruler of the Pharisees, would have known or should have known the scriptures that we just read in Ezekiel. He should have known that there was such a thing as a new birth that was possible with God. John 3, 5, Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now we're going to cover that, so bear with me. I want you to get the things that water symbolizes. Here are the things that water symbolizes. Revelation 21, 6. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life. 
And that water of life is meaning salvation freely. So water symbolizes salvation. Water symbolizing the word of God, Ephesians 5, 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water, meaning the word of God. By the word, it says in that, Ephesians 5, 26. So water means salvation, and also it symbolizes the word of God. Water symbolizing the Holy Spirit. So you got three things, salvation, word of God, and now you got the spirit. Three things that water it symbolizes in the Bible. John 7, 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. There the uh, water symbolizes the Holy Spirit. Now we've got to find out what's going on. Water symbolizes salvation, the word of God, and the spirit. Now let's go back to John chapter 3, and let's read those verses again. Born of water is not symbolizing salvation, for the entire passage is on salvation. John 3, 5, born of water is not symbolizing the spirit, for the Holy Spirit is already mentioned in that passage. John 3, 5, born of water symbolically means born of the word of God with the idea of cleansing or washing. The cleansing word, Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Born again by the word or by hearing the gospel. Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Regeneration takes place by the active work of the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. And we're gonna talk about that Holy Spirit in just a minute more distinctly. Watch this carefully. You have the spirit of man, that's where he makes contact with God. You have the body of man, that's where he contacts the world. You have the soul of man, that's where he contacts other men. No contact with God when the spirit is dead. Contact with the world is about you. Contact with man is in the soul. Now watch this on the bottom left hand in the green. Watch it carefully. The Holy Spirit acts in place of the dead spirit and causes the dead spirit to come in contact with the water of the word and opens the understanding for salvation. That is a powerful statement. The Holy Spirit takes the place of the dead spirit and causes that dead spirit to come in contact with the water of the word of God and opens the understanding for salvation. Aren't you glad the spirit worked in your heart, in your dead spirit? How many of you are glad the Holy Spirit worked on your dead spirit? Amen and amen. The work of the Holy Spirit in creation, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light. Now I tell you, until the Spirit of God moved, there was not what took place at creation. Thank God for the moving of the Holy Spirit on creation. Work of the Holy Spirit in the birth of Christ, Luke 1, 34 and 35, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be seen? I know not a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Amen. The, word, uh, the work of the Word of God. The Word reveals to man, to man his need of a new birth. The Word reveals to man his spiritually dead condition. The word reveals to man that he is under the sentence of eternal death. The word reveals to man that there is a rescue awaiting through Jesus Christ. The new birth, John 3, 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. 1 Peter 1, 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. If you would like to have a new birth, 
like we've been talking about. You might want to tell that to God, the Father, in these words or in your own way. It doesn't have to be these words, but it can be something similar to it. Dear God, I know that I am a sinner and spiritually dead. I believe your son Jesus Christ died to pay for my sins and then arose from the dead to give me spiritual life. I now trust him as my personal savior. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins, for giving me your perfect righteousness and for everlasting life in heaven with you. I love you. I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Reconciliation, expiation, and regeneration have removed those three blocks. That enslavement to sin, the penalty of sin, death, spiritual death, and regeneration, the physical birth. Let's bow for prayer. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, I pray now that you'd take the message and you'd use it for your honor and your glory. If there's one here that has never been born again by the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing their dead spirit in contact with the Word of God and opening their understanding to the need of salvation, I pray that this will be the day that the Holy Spirit will speak to that person right now. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, is there anyone here say, Pastor Waters, I'm not sure that I have been truly born again. Would you slip your hand up? I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I just want to pray for you. Say, I'm not sure that I'm born again. Would you slip your hand up? Anybody? And all those that say for sure, Pastor of Waters, I know without a doubt that I've been born again by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God. Can I see your hand? Amen, amen, amen. Father, thank you for these that have come and listened so intently this morning. I pray that you'd use the message as it goes out. And we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.